Hi, my name is Henry Coleman, and today is January the 3rd, 2003, and I'm here with Mr. Thomas Moore, who we're interviewing for the Archive of American Television here in Los Angeles, California. Well, Tom, we'd like to take about uh, 10 minutes to get some information about your early years and your influences, like uh, what was your name at birth? Uh, Thomas Walter Moore. Did you have any nicknames? Uh, just Tom. Where were you born? Meridian, Mississippi. And your birth date? September the 17th, 1918. Uh, what was your father's name? Thomas Miller Moore. What did he do? He was a cotton barn broker uh, in the South. Uh, through Alabama and Mississippi, uh, and he died very when I was very young. He died when I was three years old. He was only 34 years old. Uh, so I was uh, reared by a widowed mother uh, who had a tremendous influence on my life. She reared me and my two sisters uh, and uh, got us all through college. and. Uh, we owe a great deal of debt to her. What was her name? Abita Josephine Strobel. Uh, they were married in, uh, I believe, about uh, 1911. And uh, she became a school teacher and uh, taught uh, until very near her death, which was when she was 80 years old. You mentioned sisters. You have two sisters. I have two sisters. I have one, Helen Dawson, uh, who is in Oxford, Mississippi, and uh, Jerry Bayer, who is in Meridian still. And they are uh, both still alive, both older than I, and I had the great fortune to be reared by three women. Did you grow up in Meridian? Grew up entirely in Meridian. and. Uh, we were living on a farm originally, and uh, after my father died, uh, uh, my mother moved into town and uh, taught school in the Meridian School System, fifth grade in one of the grammar schools. And I went all the way through Meridian High School, finished in 1935. Did your family uh, suffer at all from the Great Depression? Did you? It was, it was greater in retrospect than I, as a young person, realized. But the Depression hit Mississippi harder than any place in the country. Unemployment was at 25 and 30 percent. Nobody had any money for anything. Uh, there was bartering. There was a concerted effort to stay alive. And we had very, very little. I think my uh, mother's salary was $65 a month teaching school. And we had a, we had a very uh, difficult time. But I went to work uh, for the newspaper when I was 12. We're going to get to that in a minute. Now tell uh, me what your hobbies were when you were growing up. Well, the Boy Scouts, uh, Boy Scout movement was a very big thing. And, in my part of the world at that time. And you couldn't wait until you got to be 12 years old so you could join. And there was the Cub Scouts, but that wasn't really the significant thing. But we spent a, I spent a lot of time on the Boy Scout thing, went all the way through to the Eagle Scout and the whole bit. And I, I think it was very, very fortunate. I, I owed the Scout movement a great deal. Did you know at that time what you wanted to be when you grew up? I was always interested in the newspaper. I always was interested. I didn't know enough about it when I uh, was in uh, junior high school when I started taking papers, uh, delivering a route of the Meridian Star. And uh, after about a year or two, I also took over the, uh, the business of getting the early editions on the train. Uh, the, in those days, the train had come whirling through town, and you hang the bag on a hook, and it'd take the papers. 
and I had to get them on the hook. <laughs> to tell, get. tell us about some of the early influences on your life. Did, did you go to the movies very much? Oh, yes. Movies were much a part. Ten cents for movies. Uh, Saturday afternoons, right? Well, Saturday afternoon was big, but uh, with the newspaper, if you didn't have any kicks, kicks being a missed newspaper at somebody's home, nobody called in, uh, they gave you a free t uh, ticket to the movie on Saturday. So that was the, that was the big uh, event. Did you listen to the radio? Uh, radio, I remember as hearing the first time in my life at Boy Scout camp when I was 12 years old, which is about, uh, would, have, would have been about 1929. <clears throat> Crystal Set, the fellow had, a, had one of them in the room, and I heard it for the first time, and then I saw one the next week with an antenna that went very much. But in Meridian, Mississippi, we did not have a, uh, a radio station until WCOC came on the air sometime in about 19... Uh, I guess 1930. Did, do you remember what your favorite radio programs were? Oh yes, the uh, like everyone else, Amos and Andy, and that was to play a great part in my life later. Uh, I didn't know that at the time, but uh, that was one of a phenomena of its time in radio. I loved the uh, short singing programs they had with Bing Crosby and uh, Joe Stafford and all of the radio personalities. The uh, station in Meridian was affiliated with CBS, and that was the only one we had. That was the only one you could get. At night, you could get Shreveport and Birmingham and New Orleans, but not in the daytime. After high school, what did you do? I went to Mississippi State College uh, in the fall of 1935. Uh, I have gone through with my children and my grandchildren the great problems of getting into a university. I showed up at uh, Starkville, Mississippi, at Mississippi State with a $20 bill uh, on a safety pin on my undershirt and my baggage and my high school diploma, and, and, and that was it. And you enrolled like in a line that uh, as the first time they saw you or heard of you. But you were in school, if you had that uh, meal ticket for the first month, no tuition, and you just started school. What did you study there? Well, and my mother was very anxious for me to be an engineer. She had, didn't have much faith in the, in the communications world. She was a practical soul, and her, her family had always uh, been working people, and she thought I ought to have... Uh, Engineering, I started out with, with uh, most of the engineering courses, except for the course that required ones in freshmen and so on. Then you did go into the armed forces, didn't you? Tell us about that. Well, I had gone to, uh, I had gone to Mississippi State for three years and then wanted to go to the journalism school at the University of Missouri. Uh, and I went to Columbia uh, uh, for only one semester. And... Uh, we didn't, uh, I wasn't doing as well there in making the money I had to stay alive with, so I was going to pull out of there. I did not get a degree uh, from Missouri. I uh, uh, worked very hard uh, at college. I had a very ordinary record, nothing to write home about because I had three jobs at one time at Mississippi State, and it's a little difficult to do very much studying. But uh, I went, uh, uh, stayed out of college, intended to stay out a year, make some money, and then go back and finish. And then along came 1939 with the draft. And I was about the third one pulled out of that fishbowl by Franklin Roosevelt with a number, and I had to go hustling to get into the service because if I didn't, I was going to be drafted and I would be in a, I was not in college. That couldn't help me. I, uh, nothing could help me. I was about 21 years old, physically fit, and, and I, was, I was going to be drafted and sent to Camp Shelby to be in the infantry, and I didn't want that. So I went to New Orleans and uh, toured the Navy, Availability recruiting 
prospects. And they decided that, uh, that the best thing at that time would be for me to, there were no, I wanted to be commissioned as an officer in public relation or what was the news part of it, but there were no, va no vacancies then. So they decided the best thing for me to do was to get in aviation. There was a program called V-5, which was flying, and they were very anxious for aviators. This was following the uh, order of uh, Franklin Roosevelt for 50,000 airplanes. You may recall that great speech. So what did you finally fly, F-4Fs? No, I flew flying boats for the entire war. The PBYs? PBYs, PBMs, OS2Us, and I was never off of floats after uh, I got to primary and instrument training in, uh, in Corpus Christi. When were you discharged from the Navy? 1946, in February, when the war was over. I went in about uh, uh, nine months before the war began, uh, and uh, got out about uh, six months. Uh, well, they actually, I was through at Christmas time, but I had enough leave accumulated that the uh, separation uh, reads, I think, February of 1946. Let me ask you, when was the first time you ever saw television? Uh, I had gone to, after I got out of the service here, I had uh, gone to work to get a job. My idea was to get enough money together to uh, uh, apply for a radio station. And uh, I went to work for Forest Lawn out in Glendale. And I uh, kind of oversold myself a little bit there to get the job in their public relations department. And uh, uh, I produced uh, a number of things for them. One of them was this Easter Sunrise Service. And there was a guy in town by the name of Klaus Landsberg. Klaus was a German who was a technical genius. And he was a behind the camera, behind the, the transmitter, the whole thing. He had better than anybody. He got the first commercial license that was ever issued in the United States, Channel 5, KTLA, in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, he came to me and said, listen, will you let me televise the Easter Sunrise service? Well, of course, I said, for crying out loud, television. I said, well, well who's going to see it? He says, oh, there's, there's 1,500 sets in Los Angeles. 1,500. So I said, I don't care, but I've got to touch base with the head man, but he'll be tickled to death. So when I got through with that thing, the last thing we did was to release about uh, six dozen white doves into the air, you know. And I got, I went, I, I had no more to do with the, we, we on CBS, Coast to Coast, incidentally. Uh, I, I was through with the producing, and I took the headphones off and walked back to the truck. And I walked up into the back end of that thing, and I looked at those, that, Finale, and I said, no, damn, this is it. This is for me. This is for me. <laughs> so, I just want to, I want to pinpoint the, the year that you did that, around 47 or 48, was that? 49. 49, okay. Um, did you think the television would last? I mean, did you? Oh, golly, I went down, uh, Klaus uh, had me to come down. Uh, he was doing wrestling, uh, phony wrestling, real phony stuff. Uh, and then uh, the next night I went down and he was doing uh, Lawrence Welk, uh, sponsored by an automobile dealer, a Dodge dealer here in town. This is about 19, I would say 1950. And I, 49 and 50, right in there. And I had no doubt in my mind that the that uh, television was everything. I forgot radio immediately. But I went to work for CBS in radio, uh, KNX. And CBS had missed the boat a little bit on television. 
NBC was way ahead of them. KTLA was everything in town here. Uh, after the Kathy Fergus, uh, Kathy Fiscus, where the child was in the well, uh, they sold something like they doubled the size of sets in one day in town. Uh, they sold three or four thousand sets because they had full coverage of that all day all long, day long and all night. Yeah, and everybody was glued to the TV set, waiting for uh, uh, the rescue. Now, of course. The, the whole thing just was the exploding point in Los Angeles. And I uh, uh, had an opportunity to go to CBS and radio, knowing full well they would solve the problems. CBS went in partnership in Channel 11 uh, here in Los Angeles with the Los Angeles Times. They did not, uh, they did not get uh, along too well. Uh, they were just too divergent in interest. CBS then made a deal with, uh, uh, with the automobile dealer uh, that owned Channel 9, I mean Channel 2, to swap them for Channel 9. And uh, CBS got Channel 2. And then they gave us the opportunity to go to work uh, for television, although the money came down. They, they, called the Magic Lantern and didn't seem to have the future that uh, radio did, and radio was not. The radio people were very scary of television, almost as much as the motion picture people were. But that was my start in the business, and I, got, I w was offered, uh, the, a lot of the fellows went over to 1313 North Vine where we were all stationed. My cohorts on that floor were uh, Jim Aubrey, Ray Bindolf, Bobby Wood, and uh, uh, the, the, all those guys were later to, to get prominent places in the production or in the management of television. Well, Robert Wood became president of CBS Television. I was president of ABC at the same time Bob Wood was president. I, uh, I was, uh, NBC had uh, two presidents at that time. CBS had the first uh, office in New York, the first time I went to CBS. They were in the, uh, they wouldn't even let them in 485 Madison Avenue. They were down in Grand Central Station in a small office. Jack Van Valkenburg, do you remember that name? Jack was the president of, of, of television and was regarded as a social outcast to everybody in broadcasting. But uh, uh, KNX, I mean, uh, the uh, KNXT uh, took off. Jim Aubrey became manager of the station. Bobby Wood was his sales manager. Before we uh, the, get on with that, I want to ask you, though, about what you did in, in uh, CBS radio. Were you doing sales? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, for the local station, selling, and for the station. At that time, there was no taping. There was a repeat of even network shows out of New York. They'd do the thing live. Mr. Paley thought that that's the only way to survive in radio is to stay live. And I get the commercials. We had the full job of getting the commercial from the sponsor getting it to the persons that were there. Chet Huntley was the, Chet Huntley and Wally Sterling were the half hour that I had for getting the commercials in the right place. They were on at 6, six to 6.30 in the evening, five times a week. You know, Chet, of course, went on to NBC and with Huntley became the top news show. Uh, Sterling became ch uh, chairman and uh, chancellor of Stanford University, and uh, was for and was a great friend of mine for the next fifteen years. The advertisers sponsored the full program in those days, didn't they? Yes. Yes, and um, they would take a they would take a half hour for an, of some sort. It, it, was, it was a combination of national programming and local, uh, but. Uh, uh, 
television was my real interest in direction. Were your responsibilities the same kind of thing in the television side? As no, you were, as I, I, I never went to work for Channel 2 uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, I went to work for CBS Film Sales. Uh, CBS Film Sales was the used car lot of, of network. They would run, it, run something on the network that they owned, and then after it had been on the network, we would go out and sell the reruns, with the exception of the Gene Autry show. And then we made some of our own, Range Rider, uh, Annie Oakley, uh, mostly in the Western and the kid field, Art Linkletter and the kids. And those, I had the 11 Western states, 11 Western states to sell those shows in. I had a tremendous break in that the civil rights movement was underway, especially in the East and the South. And they forced Amos and Andy off the air. It was one of the highest rated shows on the network. It only ran one season on television, and Mr. Paley pulled it off. He did that personally. Under pressure? Under tremendous pressure, because that was really the start of it, and they felt that it was a demeaning show and did not depict the blacks in the way that they wanted to be, and it was. But I had the 11 Western states, and there was no civil rights movement out here. I sold that show. Uh, incidentally, there were 65 shows on film, and only 26 had run on the network. So I had a fantastic year of selling. I, I, at that time, there was one station in Seattle, one station in Denver, or no stations in Phoenix, uh, four stations in San Francisco, and four here. But where I really made the money was selling Amos and Andy. It was a commission job, I meant to say. It was a, no, no salary just commission. I had to, to take that job from where I was was a great, uh, a great jump of faith there that uh, my wife went along with after some convincing, but I never regretted it. You must have had a lot of self-confidence at that part, at that time, to be able to go out and face all those different kind of prospective advertisers. Well, it, you call, it, it might have been self-confidence at that time. I don't know what you call it. But I had no doubt at any time that I was going to succeed. And the first six months were very tough, uh, very difficult. The first sale I made was to a station coming on the air, KOY down in Phoenix. And then KTTV here in Los Angeles became my best customer. They were independent when the CBS moved out, and they had to fill a lot of programming. So that... Uh, I had a lot of breaks, and I got a call in Denver when I was there one time from uh, Merle Jones. Uh, you know Merle? He was president of uh, uh, CBS at the time, and he wanted me to come to New York. This is 1954. wanted me to come to New York and uh, be the national sales manager. Of, of CBS film sales. So I went back there. They moved me back, moved my family. We sold our house here uh, out on Otsego Street in the valley, the GI house <laughs> we bought after the war, and uh, moved Kit and Caboodle to New York. And we're there then for 34 years. How big was CBS television at that point? You, you mentioned they had been at Grand Central. And just had moved into four. What was it? I four remember. I remember them telling me that in the year that I went back there, we were making money because we had no cost of programming. We were strictly an agent selling. Selling. Incidentally, I want to tell you about the coincidence of of Viacom, because to get back to your question though, CBS lost. The year that I went back there, $67 million on television. And it was not really until 56 that they broke even. 
So that's, that, that doesn't, that's not really the answer to your question because I didn't know that much about that work. I just heard them bemoaning how much television was costing and how it, how it drained radio. That was the period. The free zone station was a very costly thing for the network. In 1949, they were getting so many applications for TV sets that they put a freeze on it. The FCC. Yes. And they did not release any applications until I believe it was 1952 or 3. And from that time on, you could, you could just feel the change that was taking place uh, in the whole industry. Uh, the, the, we used to say we can't lie fast enough to keep up with the truth. We couldn't go out and sell this thing. We'd say that there are 150,000 sets in Los Angeles, and then we'd pick up the paper, and hell, it was 225. So we'd say there's 300,000, and then we, we were selling the medium itself rather than specific. Uh, I was selling specific shows, but the medium was exploding. Did you have uh, a difficult time adjusting to life in New York as opposed to a Working in Los Angeles? Uh, CBS crowd, uh, the group, uh, had started to move back there. CBS film sales and CBS uh, uh, spot sales, uh, both of those things the government made them get out of. But that was the crowd that I was interested in. We bought a house. We, we, we rented a house in Darien, Connecticut. And we did that uh, because I had a, a, a son that was uh, uh, about uh, eight or nine years old and a daughter that was four. And we wanted them to have a good school, and we went to the place that those that had preceded me. See, I knew these guys coming out uh, uh, from, from spot sales and from, from going back there to sales meetings. We knew one another, and we knew where the CBS group was, and they were settling in and around Greenwich and, uh, and, and Darien, Connecticut, and that's where we went. Now, 1951 or two was a time when McCarthyism was beginning. Were you affected at all by the blacklist? I mean, did you know any of people who were not part at all. of that? Not at all. I had, I had an awareness, but nothing, uh, nothing that I felt or that the media felt that I was aware of. Uh, the media was a big factor, of course, in the, in the unseating of him and the disgrace of the MacArthur investigation. Did CBS ever ask you to sign a loyalty oath? No. No. Now, you were at CBS up until what year, like 56? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you went to ABC as yes. vice president of sales. That's right. Tell us about that. Well, Jim Aubrey had left CBS and gone to this ABC. We were very close friends, had been together from the very beginning when we started out here, 1313. I want to pick that up in just a moment. We're going to All change right. tapes. <laughs> 